Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, a session where we're going to be talking about diversity in uh, 2022. Uh, it remains perhaps the, the most important issue that we can be discussing. And I am delighted to be joined today by Steve Davis of the APA, by Sophie Gold, who is the founder and owner of Eleanor in the United States, by Kirsten Emhoff, who is uh, the owner on, and CEO of, or the founder and CEO, to get it strictly right, of Pretty Bird, and by Mike Figgis, who is an acclaimed film director, uh, twice nominated for Leaving Las Vegas, I believe. Uh, so thank you for uh, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, let's get let's get straight into it. So the first question, Kirsten, let me put this to you. Do you do you, it's it's five years, six years since the foundation of Free the Bid, and, and in that time, because of various uh, incidents, we've seen uh, a number of initiatives. Do you feel that we have made progress, and what more do you feel we must be doing in order to improve the situation? Um, I feel like we've made some progress by just having organizations like Free the Bid. Bid Black, Change the Lens, raise awareness and start to gather filmmakers and give them a platform for their, for their work and opportunities. I think that the industry has not fully made a commitment to diversi diversifying our industry. And so what we see happening is you get a lot of people saying, oh, make sure that there's a woman in the bid pool. Make sure there's a woman and a person of color in the bid pool. But then when it comes time to awarding the job, what we hear frequently is, well, that person doesn't have the track record to actually get the job. So it seems like there's a lot of box checking and not enough full commitment to giving people opportunities. And for just based on your own experience, um, you Pretty Bird, uh, I, I would venture to suggest, has a, has a good track record here. You've got a very diverse um, roster of directors. Have you noticed a, a, a change in terms of it being easier to win work for uh, female and non-white directors? Uh, has, it, has it remained roughly the same? What's been your experience over the last few years? I mean, we've had a commitment to building diverse creators since we were founded and when I started it in, in 13 years ago. So I feel like we've been one of the early companies that was pounding on everyone's door, trying to get opportunities for these filmmakers and had a lot of success with directors like my partner, Paul Hunter, Melina Matsukas. So it's been a struggle but we've found success with it now i think yeah there's more awareness of it but like i said it's still the situation where we're bidding a ton of jobs with directors of color and female directors but the percentage of the directors that are actually getting the jobs is quite low well let's bring sophie in at this point um sophie you, you you're obviously in a very similar position um and, and how would you what would you describe as, as your experience of dealing with this specific issue of trying to uh, win work, uh, get people in the room and and so on uh, in the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, just it's it's the same really. I mean it's it's a lot of box checking. Um, I recently had a project where we bid on it and just after we got the email that we didn't get the project, uh, we were sent a questionnaire to fill out that this particular agency had bid, you know, diversely, which I felt was quite offensive. <laughs> um, and I did not fill out the questionnaire. Um, but it, it, it feels that this industry does very well at performative um, diversity in terms of we saw, you know, this year's Super Bowl where, you know, I, I've never seen so many black people in front of the camera. It was just like, go out there and grab a black person. But in terms of who actually directed these spots, I think it was the director was like less than five of the directors were uh, people of color and female. Um, and we're going to see the same thing happen with this year's Super Bowl coming up. As I've done my research, it's the same thing. The same people are directing it because they are seen as safe. 
and I have said this all up and down town, is that we cannot continue to play this like match game. If they have it on the reel, then they can do it. We really have to go back to recognizing talent and how our industry really flourished you know 10 20 years ago when all of these directors came up they didn't have much a lot of them had skateboard films and whatever else on their on their reels but they were given the opportunity to be creative and that you know launched their careers so it's extremely difficult and we won't even talk about the cost factor of what what it is uh you know as an owner of a production company to continue you know bid on projects and only to not get them or not get a large amount of them but yet we're still having to deal with you know the cost of bidding so it's yeah it's a struggle steve let me bring you in at this point um the the, the apa must be aware uh of what's just been spoken obviously for for Kirsten and Sophie, their experiences in the United States, but I think it's a pretty similar picture in London. Uh, that there is, there does seem to be a, a great deal of, um, to use Sophie's word, performative uh, uh, inclusion on t- in terms of bids. Uh, have people drawn your attention to this as, as head of the trade association? And what action do you think? I mean, I remember, Steve, you when we we were together at the um, launch event for Free the Bid in London and you spoke and you spoke about you made a comparison with, um, you know, the black coaches in in, uh, the NFL and how, you know, it took a long time for, for you know, the sort of positive discrimination or, or affirmative action, you know, whatever your preferred uh, coinages for for that to to yield results, but it does feel from from where I'm sat as though we we really are going backwards. Frankly, um, there doesn't seem to be any progress. What's what's the APA's position on this? What do you think? What more can be done? Well, I think a huge amount more can be done. We have a seven point plan for improving diversity, but it could be a hundred point plan for improving diversity, and it all requires a huge amount of work and. I think we'll be talking about this in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years because this goes to the whole concept of inequality in society, social class, and and many, many things. We're not going to fix those, but we should be improving them. And I think our challenge is, I think we have to improve them year on year, uh, but also accept that we're not going to fix them entirely. And so we, we should not be complacent about progress and say this is good enough, but neither should we despair and say it's not equal yet. We're not making any progress. We've got to we've got to hit somewhere between those points and continue to make progress every year. But I see lots of complexities just on the director issue, which is one of the many issues we could discuss. But I see uh, stuff from agencies, and they at the very last minute they say something: "Have you got a woman director, or a black director, or a director in a wheelchair?" And it's all too late, and it's all ad hoc, and it's a mishmash. And what I've said to agencies and to clients to some extent is. You all need to have the same policy and you need to publish that policy as to what you expect from a production company you're working with so that everybody knows when I engage with you, this is what you're going to expect and put forward because all this sort of last minute thinking, put somebody in, it, it's just, it just doesn't work. And so at the moment, it's, it's incoherent. And so there's a huge amount of work to do to change what is positive thoughts into positive action. So So just to follow up from what you said, Steve, is I spent all of last year as the chair of the subcommittee for diversity for the AICP, and we had a whole load of roundtables with various different agencies. And, you know, they were passing the buck saying that, you know, a lot of the decisions come from the clients. And then when you talk to the clients, you know, a lot of the decision comes from the agency. And ultimately, you know, apart from how we created these best practice guidelines, we went all up and down. But ultimately, I think it really is about money. Like, and, and I don't think it's a PowerPoint presentation. It's just, you say, you know, there was this article published in Ad Age last week about all of these different brands that want to increase their spending, you know, with minority vendors and, 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 and talent. But it's really like, if you have a product, like, Again, to go back to what's happened with the Super Bowl, if there's truly a commitment for diversity, then take that money, knowing that that director or edit or whatever will be, you know, supported by the best in the business and give them the money and put them on the biggest stage in order to then, you know, get more work and build up their their thing. So for me, 
when I'm having these conversations with agencies and they're like, well, we just we want to put together a plan. I'm like, it really is about money. I've seen jobs awarded for the most stupid reasons. So why can't we just award jobs based on actually increasing the amount of people that, or, or you know, directly, you know, that do these projects, you know what I mean? That's kind of my frustration. It's like, can we get away from PowerPoints and everything else and just take your hard earned money and, and hire diversely. Mike, let's bring you in at this point. Obviously, your perspective is slightly different. I think you have worked in, in the advertising industry, but your experience is mainly in feature films, which is similarly dominated by white men. Uh, how, how do you account for that through your experience in the business? How meritocratic uh, do you feel the business is? And if you do feel that um, that change is required, what would you suggest? Well, <clears throat> it's it's very complicated. I think. I mean, I, you know, I came into filmmaking after I, you know, I, I had a career as a musician and a composer first. So I came in, you know, with a sort of very wide-eyed and um, full of enthusiasm as a kind of independent you know, experimental filmmaker. That's what I did. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I still want to do. And then I had the good or bad fortune to have a kind of minor hit that took me to America, got an agent, did the whole thing, ended up in the studio system, which was about 15 years. It was a kind of horrific learning curve with some success, but a lot of failure. However, I did use my time to kind of observe how the, how the industry works. And the, and the answer is it works appallingly badly. Um, it is the most you know, financially inefficient system you can possibly imagine. It's totally based on clubs. It's totally based on who you know and who you have breakfast with. And I did a series about 20 years ago called Hollywood Conversations. I interviewed 20, 25 people in Hollywood. One of them was Bruckheimer, you know, um, and he kept correcting me when he said, Mike, it's called the film business. It's called show business. It's somebody else's money. And the thing is, this idea of creativity, trying to kind of exist in that world, that's the first point I would make, has always been a huge problem. What was immediately apparent was how singularly undiverse it was, like there were virtually no women at all. And that was all based on the idea that the equipment was so heavy that, that women couldn't carry it, you know, going back to the, the, the dawn of cinema. And, of course, it was very heavy. But then we had the digital revolution, and there was a moment of absolute terror where everybody thought, you know, God, my job is going to unscrew it, you know, uh, my second home, the three cars, the mistress, whatever, you know. Hollywood was literally quaking with fear. So what they did very quickly was reinvent very heavy digital equipment so that uh, they could justify having the big fat man to carry it again, you know, and that's way too heavy. You know, in terms of color and ethnicity, always, I mean, I mean, where, I mean, where do you begin? Horrifically racist, you know. Uh, I did a film called One Night Stand, replaced Nicolas Cage with, with, with uh, yeah, Wesley Snipes, you know, and, and the leading actress with, with a Chinese actress. And it was like, yeah, it was a learning curve, man. I mean, you know, the reviews came out and they were offensive in many cases. And somebody pointed out they're offensive because they felt Wesley Snipes was way too arrogant um, f for that character. Had it been Nick Cage or, or, you know, Sean Penn or somebody, they wouldn't have blinked an eye. It would have been part of the DNA of the character. So that's a whole horrific can of worms. Right now, we also have a crisis, which is post um, Me Too and, and everything that's happened. Cinema is on its knees. Uh, the film industry is going down the toilet very quickly, and Netflix is basically taking over. So this kind of panic, a combination of panic for your welfare, for your survival, and secondly, among young filmmakers, such confusion about their identity what they're supposed to be, how political they're supposed to be, what kind of a story they have to tell, and all of that. I see chaos, and I see really insecure young filmmakers who, who actually are often very scared, you know. In terms of, like, people like me bitching about, well, you can't even get a job now because I'm not, you know, either gay or whatever, you know. As somebody pointed out the other day, I think it was a line in White Lotus or something, it's, it's not your turn, you know. <laughs> 
it's not your turn to eat at the table. I thought that was fair enough. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Shut up, you know. But at the same time, the other observations I think are valid. And I'm, I've been, I'm kind of fascinated by the world of, of visual creativity because it's such a mess right now. And it's a combination of capitalistic mess, the equipment mess, the, uh, you know, the, the identity mess. Um, it'll settle down, you know. And I, but I'm, what I'm hoping is that rather than trying to just deal with that existing system, it's, it's kind of done. It's out of date, like politics, it's out of date. And we actually do need to come up with something radically different that would then have the appropriate spaces for everybody. You know, everybody should be making, everybody should be working. It's crazy. But, isn't, but that's, the, that's the terror, isn't it? Like, as you said before, when the digital revolution started, it was the prospect of a kind of more democratic form of filmmaking that, that persuades minutes, yeah. the people with capital to exert their re-exert their control. So yeah, but I mean, I, I give an example of the studio mindset. I remember going in for a pitch meeting on a Brad Pitt project, and it was so low budget in the script. It should have been shot on sixteen millimeter in someone's apartment, and I can't remember the studio. It was one of the big ones, and, and I said, "What's the budget?" And they said, "Like twenty five million." And I went, "What?" And they said, not enough. And I went, I was thinking more like three, you know. And they all looked at each other and said, Mike, there's no problem with the budget. It's fixed. Next question, you know. So this kind of protectionism, going back to what, you know, Elena Sophie said, you know, it is about money. Ultimately, it is about money. And people will always pass the buck and blame somebody else. It's never their problem. Never. Kirsten, given, given that, as Sophie and Mike have both pointed out, um, it's it's ultimately about the money. Um, how how and and I think Mike raises a good point about uh, the the the, um, the intrusion really of creativity into what is a business uh, a business arrangement, if you know what I mean. To how do you, how do we break through that? And and also, I, can I also sort of ask you two questions in one? Mike also mentioned that we have some new, very big players in this marketplace, in in the broader marketplace outside of advertising, particularly in in the uh, guise of um, Netflix, uh, Amazon, Apple, Disney, and so on. Are, are are you involved with talking to those companies as well? And and is there? Do you think there's a chance of a, a better approach? on television than we've seen in advertising and in film? Um, there's a lot to unpack there with those questions. Um, I think that what both Mike and Sophie said about it's about money and it, it it's a business are really important for us to look at in actually making more progress because in advertising, in in all entertainment, whether it's film or TV, it, it, it is a business and we all know as creatives that we're not in this business as a charity. We're not in it to lose money. So any creator, I don't care how amazing like Mr. Figgis is, every creator has to learn about building their own brand and being in a business. But I think ultimately it's the people that have the money and that are ultimately responsible for the projects that have the most power to make a change in what everyone else is doing from advertising agencies to production companies. When someone says you're only going to get this budget, if you allocate X amount of dollars towards, you know, diverse crews have a certain amount of percentage of diverse filmmakers create apprenticeship programs. Our industry is an amazing apprenticeship business. We've tried to talk to unions and, and guilds about, the most amazing way to get in the door to be in the, you know, grip and electric department or in the sound department is to be able to apprentice and, and have people that are experienced in that show younger people how to, you know, learn a trade. And those positions and those opportunities are as important, if not more important than how many directors are doing Super Bowl commercials. And I think if we look at the industry as a whole, instead of just looking at, like Sophie said, you can turn on any Netflix show, you can turn on any advertising right now and see a ton of people of color. 
because that was the first step. People mandated, clients mandated it, studios mandated it. You know, we have to see these people. It's a, we're watching people boycotting and stuff like that. It has to be done. So we have to look at the entire business and how people can start to say, it's not okay to walk into a room or look at a panel and only have one person of color on it. It's just not okay. People have to stand up and say no, and then let us figure out how to actually make that happen. Yeah, and and just bringing you uh, to the question about television, are you getting are you sensing a better approach if you're involved with those companies? If you're not, then say say that. But uh, if you're involved with those companies, are you sensing a better approach? I mean, look, we're, we do a lot of uh, a lot of documentaries, a lot of unscripted right now. I think that there are conversations, but I also think that it it's not as much of a specific like, oh, we we want creators that are of color or female creators. They're looking for stories that are relating to an audience that is now asking for more stories and more, you know, you're starting to see success of filmmakers and shows like Insecure and, you know, directors of color coming into these shows and the audiences are loving them. That's the business. When you start listening to what the audience wants, the business is going to respond to that. So I think that I see more than um, specifics like you need to have a black person or a female in a bid pool because we're not really pitching shows that way. Yes. I mean, I, I, Sophie, let me put this to you. I think that potentially part of the problem is discussions like these is that, the, that we as an industry are continually framing the idea of diversity inclusion as a favor that, that we as white stakeholders, as white male stakeholders in particular, are doing for women and people of color. You know, that we ought to be better about it. That focuses on it in a very negative way. And, and it, it implies that essentially we're diluting uh, the creativity in order to achieve a social good. But surely... The message from you and, and from other people who are advocating for women and and uh, black filmmakers, it's about missed opportunity and the, the fact that the storytelling isn't diverse, not that the people who are telling the stories isn't. It does, it does feel a lot of the time like it is a favour, like, oh, and like you'll see, you know, um, agencies and brands, like I had a call with a... <laughs> with a brand who was like, we just we just got someone on for this huge, huge car brand. We just got someone on of color, like, look at us. And he, you know, he was really excited about it that they had done that. But I just really want to get to the point where we're not having these panels anymore and, and it doesn't seem like some weird favor or, or you're getting a pat on the back because you've increased your, you know, spending by another two. I mean, I, in this Ad Age article, this brand, literally said you know we're going to increase by another two percent i was just like what this is such bs that <laughs> doesn't make any sense like two percent doesn't move the needle at all it's just a joke it's all it's just to tell your stakeholders and your shareholders that look we're we're trying to participate what we're you know we're doing the least we can do but we really do need radical change and you and I we've spoken about this a lot Jason is like when George Floyd's death happened people were really like ready to do stuff and the more and more time has gone on the more it's on the back burner that you know people have taken down the black boxes you know they're not really you know having internal conversations or doing anything so yeah it's it feels like a favor and I think it feels that and also, just going back to it too, it's also this perception. There's a lot of big directors that are super talented. I mean, I represented a, a, a black director, a huge feature guy, could not get commercials to save his life. I mean, I just couldn't even believe it. Like, he gets $200 million to do a feature, but can't get like a million dollars to do a commercial because he's not seen as a safe option. <laughs> so I yeah it's I think we need to move away from it feeling like a favor and extending some breadcrumbs you know to our black brothers and sisters and people of color you know creatives and more to do with actually looking at their talent 
you know. Mike, can, being... can I get your take on that? Uh, that idea. Now, now you've been involved in the film industry for a very long time, and I think it would be fair to suggest that you were perhaps part of, although forgive me for make, if I'm making an assumption, uh, the first encroachment, the first uh, sort of allowance of people in, in the sense that, um, that originally filmmaking was very much the domain of uh, the sort of, it was controlled by uh, very posh people uh, and so on and so forth. And people, I think you're from the Northeast, uh, and in a sense, you would have been a diverse choice once upon a time. So having having been through that, what, what's your take in in terms of that that term? Because I mean, you know, I know I know it predates you, but you know, you look at the cinema of the nineteen sixties in Britain, and it was absolutely led by working class filmmakers. There was a revolution of sorts, and and it was very creative, wasn't it? So that that's mm. that surely has to be the opportunity here. Yeah, I mean. There are two separate things. One is commercials and one is, let's say, feature films. They are very different in the sense that commercials are commercial full stop. I mean, they're, they're, they're commercials are designed to sell things. Quite, that's what it says on the box. That's what they do. Feature films have a kind of artistic pretension, let's say. Um, I was thinking when, when, when actually, Sophie, when you were talking, because I'm a, I'm a, you know, started as a musician, as a jazz musician, so I'm kind of obsessed with jazz. And my dad was, so I, I'm a kind of sort of boring encyclopedia of the jazz, history of jazz, you know. And when I first started working in America, it was fascinating for me. It was like in, in the good and the bad because there was no audience. And certainly there was not a black audience for jazz, you know. And I remember interviewing B.B. King, who was personally thanking the British white musicians for putting him back on the map because he said, I didn't have an audience back in the States. And the reason he didn't have an audience was there were no venues and there was not appropriate and the way that the record industry was run was not geared towards actually attracting the appropriate audience. So my point is about audience um, and about stories. So, um, I obviously know more about, um, about feature films than I do about commercials, even though I've done some. But I would say that one of the big problems is story. So like stories are crap right now. They're, they're, they're um, algorithmic, they are predictable, and they're not really um, hitting the heart of, of, of specific audiences. I mean, the whole point about cinema and the digital revolution was suddenly this was an opportunity where everybody could have their own cinema. Everybody, you know, you know and, but no, everybody flocks towards that one little doorway, which is called, I mean, you mentioned your director was earning 200 million. Wow, lucky man, you know. Um, maybe he doesn't need a commercial, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, we have to be honest. You know, you can make a lot of money in this business and it's very hard to separate it, to be truthful about it. Are you an artist or you just want to be rich, you know? Or you want both? Well, of course we want both, you know. So my take on it is stories are crap and we need a revolution in storytelling in order to identify, you've got to hit the right audience. Once you have an audience, so if you go back to jazz, look at blues and look at rock and roll and look at, let's say, hardcore blues, as opposed to the intellectual idea of jazz, John Coltrane and all of that. Blues had a big audience. And in so way, hip hop has a huge audience, you know, like massive audience. So every, every genre has its specific audiences and there's plenty of them out there. And, you know, we don't have to all make the same thing at the same time. So what the industry needs to do is not just diversify, it needs to expand and actually start to identify. Let's go back to what I said. It's so badly organized. It's so hopelessly inefficient. If, it was a, if they were manufacturing cars, they would have gone out of business like 50 years ago. You know, it's, it's appalling because it's about money, it's about a tight group of, of guys mainly holding on to that money and that, you know, and stopping progress, Mike. I would challenge your. I would have to challenge your idea that the stories are uh, poor at the moment. I think they are. If you look in particular directions, I think uh, the sort of top end of cinema is terrible at the moment. Uh, truly, truly awful. It's just become about spectacle and so on. But we. It isn't an exaggeration when people talk about a golden era of television. The writing in television is uh, absolutely fantastic. If you're looking in the right direction. Uh it's got better. Um, <laughs> and I tell you one, my theory is that all the smart guys who are writing smart, bad movies for Hollywood actually have graduated to television and they're doing smart, bad television. And it's very, it's, it's a, it's a kind of conjuring trick. 
there is good stuff, but most of it is just very well made crap. Oh, well, very well, I mean, to, to, to be smart. fair, at, at any given time, at any given time, most of it's well made crap. But, but the you know, we're talking about there is there is a, a a seam of really good stuff, and I think I think it rather proves the point because I think the um, the the uh, creative talent within the television pool is more diverse. You know, you do have Phoebe Waller Bridge and um, uh, and and um, I'm, I'm forgetting her name, but the, the woman who uh, is Isa Ray, who runs uh, Insecure and so on. You've got these very talented women who are being given an opportunity in television that are not being given uh, elsewhere. And I think that's where you're getting the kind of the improvement. Uh, which Steve, let's let's bring you in at this point because that wasn't really a question. But do you do you? But obviously, you're concerned almost wholly with advertising. But do you perceive that uh, that it's important to sell this as a positive change, as an opportunity, rather than a, a sort of social, a, a sort of act of social kindness. Uh, I entirely agree. It is, although I don't think it matters what someone's motivation for making this change is, as long as they're actually making it. Of course, we can see that um, when you're advertising to a diverse audience, that to have people who can tell stories that diverse audience relate to is going to make the advertising better. And having diverse thoughts and thinking in a room will lead to better ideas rather than stale ideas. But it's that, it's that real commitment, I think, to, to make change that can come from anywhere. And I think I was going to mention, you know, what, what, how we affect change. I think Kirsten talked about measurable change. And clearly, you've got to have targets and you've got to try and hit those targets and you've got to be determined and determined to put the work in. And I was going to mention uh, Juliet Lath, who of course runs Pretty Bird here as an example of that, because she ensures that she has a diverse crew on her set in terms of race, in terms of gender, I think in terms of sexuality. And uh, it's often the case that a producer at her place will say, I'm sorry, I can't get those people. The shoot's in two days, I need to use these people. And she says, that's not good enough. Go back and try again until you've achieved it. And it takes that level of determination and work by a production company, by an agency, by a client, and not accepting being fogged off or excuses, even those excuses might be real, that you're under real pressure and you want to work with somebody you knew. It takes that level of commitment. And if everyone did that, we would achieve change uh, much more quickly than we're currently progressing towards. Uh, let's talk about money for a minute. Um, Graham Tyler of uh, Morking Smith drew my attention to the the the... Uh, to an article which uh, uh, was published in um, in the American trade press about the fact that um, that the, uh, the the women who are attached to money making features has actually come down the way, as Sophie alluded to. I think we saw fewer women directing commercials. Uh, you know, Super Bowl is a good metric. There's around seven. Just. Uh, you know, it's always worth mentioning for, for the audience that doesn't know this, there's around 75 new commercials each time at the Super Bowl. And for a lot of those brands, that's their biggest budget of the year. So it's a real, uh, it's a, you know, it's a real opportunity, a real yardstick of, of how we're getting on. And Sophie's numbers were about right. And, and actually, it's down on previous years, which really, it does make you question the value of the various initiatives. Uh, I, I Free the bid, I don't think it's worked. Um, and I think it's time to be honest about that. Our own initiative sister, it hasn't worked. It's time to be honest about that and reappraise and and find a new approach. But in terms of uh, in terms of money, I'm I'm led to believe by something Graham sent me. There may be a bit of a differential uh, on the two different sides of uh, the Atlantic. Um, Kirsten, I don't know. With obviously you've got your London offshoot, perhaps you're in a good position to address this. But uh, uh, is there is there pay equity uh, in is pay equity better in, in Europe than it is in the United States? And if so, why? Um, you mean pay equity with director salaries? I believe so. I mean, I only know what we do. So sorry, um, I mean, sorry, to be clear, obviously here we're still on the diversity question. So I mean, differentials yeah. between. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Between like female salary, female directors rates and male director rates. I mean, honestly, and and thank you, Steve, for giving my partner, Juliet, a shout out. We will only handle it as everyone makes the same. 
I think the way that directors' rates work are based on experience and based on what the project is. So we might look at it, but uh, we wouldn't put up a director and say, well, her rate is less. And, and I think that most of the agencies are savvy enough to not call that out and say she should charge a lower rate because there is a window of industry standard, I think, for commercials now. So we, we would definitely, definitely call that out if we ever heard it. And we haven't. Right. I, I, I feel that we're a little pushed for time, but I'm going to bring Mike in on, on that question and, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, Kirsten. I mean, in my experience in the past was they always looked at your last, you know, your last gig and said, OK, you know, you, and maybe, you know, certainly within the film system, you either got a bump or if you hadn't worked for a while, you, you fell down the ladder quite a bit. Um, it's not, not the same in, in the commercials industry. I mean, not uh, it's Mike, it's so much different because the the way that, you know, it's tied to profit, it's tied to su the success of the project, the way that people share in back end, there's a lot more chance of, of unequal distribution on the film and TV side in commercials. Like right now, the rates are pretty standard. So it would be really hard to say, you know, so-and-so, is charging $20,000 a day in the U S for a director's rate, but your female director is charging 20,000. She needs to bring that rate down. You know, it, it's just, it, we can't, people aren't going to call that kind of stuff out. It's more where it's just people bringing us into the mix. Like Sophie said, we're spending thousands and thousands of dollars pitching and doing treatments putting up directors that we believe, like my whole reputation is on building talent. If I put up a director that I think is appropriate and the creatives love their treatment, you can guarantee that we're gonna deliver that spot. But what's happening is, and this, this Super Bowl is a perfect example. I think we bid 10 spots, lost nine of them, all with directors of color and all because they didn't have a track record or so-and-so is the Super Bowl king and blah, blah, blah. But we spent all the money and did all the work to do that. And in the end, it wasn't about the budget or the director's rate. It was just this, they don't have a track record. Actually, I just want to do one last thing. I want to bring Steve in on this issue because I want to ask a very direct question. Do you think the triple bid itself is has a structural problem that is generating the cost to Kirsten and other uh, and and Sophie and other people who own companies that it's essentially unfair. It 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 directs the agencies towards a box ticking exercise, and it's perhaps time to review it. I, I think the triple bid generally is a sound exercise. But I think you have to look at why people aren't being chosen, and there are some reasons for that that aren't just racism. And we have, like any problem, we have to understand it very well to fix it. If you're a creative or say junior creative, you've written a script that at last some of the top directors in the world would look at and your career, uh, future career, probably depends on that ad becoming an award winner. You're desperate for um, whoever that person is to do the ad. Uh, and so those are pressures on them. And so the only way that, that can only really be released by the advertiser saying, no, we don't want to go down that route. We, we, want, to, we want to draw from a different population you've been to in the past. Otherwise, the pressure on everybody within it is is just to keep their job, progress their career, make money. They're stuck in the same system, really, and the clients have to somehow release people from that. Yeah, we well, we need to. We definitely need to make some changes. Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, my hope for twenty twenty two is that uh, whilst it's marvelous, absolutely marvelous, to see so many black people participating in commercials, uh, it does feel at times as though. The rationale behind it is if we keep them all on that side of the camera, then we can keep this side of the camera to ourselves and it ought to end. Thank you very much to each of you.